So now, Professor Bronstein. He is a professor at the School of Information here at Berkeley, received his doctorate in economics from Stanford, and is the author or co-author of over 50 articles in the fields of economics and information science. He focuses on competition in information products and services, in particular on how new generations of products and technologies alter the commercial landscape for incumbent players. So he's going to talk to us about something like that today. Let's give him a nice round of applause and welcome, welcome Professor Bronstein. Thank you. So what I'm going to do today is try and tie together um, several threads, at least three, uh, in a talk. One, uh, some work on uh, broadband policy. One, another thread, uh, some work on telecom policy. And then finally, some uh, more recent work on wired video competition. But they, they've come back and they've interacted and reinforced uh, each other. Um, I'm going to post a larger number of slides that I'm going to cover today. Uh, so that you can go and look at it. And some of the things I'm just going to sort of fly by. And if you want uh, uh, more detail, you can ask during the questions or uh, let me know or whatever. Um, and I want to warn you, I speak very quickly. And when I get interested in topics like I am with this, I actually speed up. Uh, and I know this. And I also start yelling at people, too. So. Um, <laughs> Uh, the yelling, there's nothing you can do about. But on the speeding up, if I'm going too fast or you need me to repeat something, just let me know. Uh, and I'll try and uh, remember uh, to uh, uh, speak at a, a more deliberate pace and uh, figure out uh, uh, what I want to cover and what I want to stress. So, um, and I don't know how much you all know uh, about uh, uh, telecom and cable TV and broadband regulation in the U.S. and elsewhere. So I'm just going to uh, uh, give you a, uh, uh, a couple of seconds overview of the, the history of regulation, which actually dates back to 1927 uh, and the Federal Ra uh, Radio Commission under Herbert Hoover uh, in the United States. Um, in 1934, uh, that was replaced by the Federal Communications Commission, and the, the uh, uh, Communications Act essentially has two, had two operative sections, one called broadcasting and one called common carriage. And for uh, years and years, decades, that became the classification scheme that was used by the regulators and by the courts for trying to decide how to approach uh, regulated uh, telecommunications and broadcast industries in the United States. And uh, other uh, uh, countries that had a similar model uh, made that same sort of division. Now, there was a completely different model, uh, particularly in Europe uh, and elsewhere, which was the PTT uh, version of things, where there was a government agency the, uh, with usually growing out of the post office, uh, the P and the PTT, that provided uh, telephone and telegraph services, and uh, uh, there was not a tradition of an independent regulator, and so on. Um, as the technologies developed, there were distinctions made by technology. So voice communications were regulated differently from data communications. Um, video uh, caused some interesting problems uh, in two different ways. One is the broadcast of video was viewed as sort of just the, the follow on to radio uh, and was uh, regulated in that way. And then the other was the wired retransmission of uh, video, what we call cable television, um, was originally seen by the FCC as sort of falling between the cracks. Um, because if you think about the, the technology of cable television, you could do this on either a broadcast type model or a common carriage type model. Uh, depending on whether the facility's owner had a control over the content and made some uh, decisions about what to carry and, and, and so on. What the FCC did with uh, approval of the courts was decide that cable television was ancillary to broadcasting. That instead of having a separate set of laws dealing with cable TV or instead of letting it fall completely between the cracks, we sort of grafted it onto the broadcasting model uh, and so on. And that's the way technology policy got developed uh, in, in the US, which was to try and find something in history that we could use as an analog to where we are going into the current problems we're facing. Well, um, 
there were lots of interesting things that developed with this. One is the, the internet. And the internet, you might want to argue in the US was completely unregulated. But I want to say that it actually fits into this tradition in that the, there's an infant industry approach to a lot of funding of the internet backbone in the regional networks in the early days of the internet, uh, Barnet and, and, and uh, things like that. Um, but little or no direct heavy-handed regulation of the FCC or Public Utilities Commission part. Although there were two policy documents that came out of the Clinton-Gore administration that are really a lot of fun to, to read uh, as to sort of the, the vision of where they, they, they saw the internet going as it was becoming commercialized and so on. Well, the, the problems with this approach are somewhat obvious. Uh, one was that I'm going to make an argument that there was a broadband policy failure. I'm going to make another argument that there was and still is a telecom policy failure, and despite the complete rewrite of the Telecommunications Act in 1996, and that um, video policy is emerging, and in fact, the states are moving into the, the video policy area. And I'm going to talk a little bit about what California has been doing there. Um, and throughout all this, in fact, there's going to be uh, this state versus federal uh, uh, set of problems that uh, just overlie, uh, overlay all of the other uh, technology and economic issues and uh, cause uh, uh, endless work for lawyers uh, in this. And um, finally, if you don't know the history of it, some of it is really intriguing. Uh, cable television regulation is um, really important stuff. People value their cable television. Uh, this all sounds improbable to me, but it's true. Uh, and in fact, if you look at the first Bush administration, um, Bush Sr., he had one veto overridden during his entire presidency. And that was a cable TV uh, deregulation uh, law. I mean, it was the only thing where Congress th thought that was important enough to override a presidential veto. Uh, so um, you might want to argue, you know, in the scheme of things and what's going on in the world, whether it's environment or uh, energy or uh, war and peace or whatever, these are trivial issues. But the <laughs> politics is, depending, I guess, on your ranking system, very high or very low. And uh, the economic issues are uh, important here. So my focus is going to be on the U.S. And, and when we get to the telecom part, a lot on Canada. Uh, as a contrast, but not entirely, because I will make a, a few comments about the, some uh, European and Asian situations. Um, that there are these traditional local telephone companies and local cable TV companies that use their networks to provide dot, 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 a list of services. And you know what they are, but they're changing. And um, not all the services are av available everywhere. So uh, a lot of it has to do with what plant is in the ground or in the, the air. Uh, so there's a mix of uh, copper and optical fiber plant. Uh, there's some wireless uh, facilities and so on. And what's intriguing to me uh, recently is the fact that we're starting to see this head-to-head -head competition in the, the telecom and cable industries in all of broadband, voice, and video. Um, and I guess that that's what we now mean by convergence. And if you looked at papers that were written on convergence in the 1980s and 90s, there was a very different sort of convergence that they were talking about. Uh, there they were talking about uh, uh, things becoming digital. They weren't talking about so much which companies were going to be. The big three were going to be, if you remember, IBM, Xerox, and AT&T, the old AT&T. Uh, and they were going to compete head to head. Uh, Xerox was going to use the X10 technology. IBM was going to be involved in internet and backbone and, and packet switching. And AT&T was making computers. Uh, and it was going to be head-to-head -head battle. And uh, that was convergence. Uh, this new convergence is really driven, I think, if we write the history, by broadband, which is really intriguing in the United States to think about it, that it's the fact that you had a cable TV network that through cable modem service could provide broadband, and you had a switched telecom network that could 
uh, using modems and then later DSL and other things provide uh, broadband. And then they started to use IP technology and other things to start to provide the services that were traditionally in the realm of each other's uh, line of business. Um, a couple of different places in this talk I have um, timelines, but I warn, warn you they're really meant to be indicative at best. Um, because uh, there's no wired video competition to my house. Uh, and uh, it's spotty across uh, the, the country and across the world as to how much of this convergence has actually taken place and what have been the, the locuses either in a technology or a geographic basis for that. Okay, so um, what, let me preview where I'm going and then uh, I'll explain to you how uh, we're uh, going to get there. First, I'm going to talk about broadband policy. Uh, and I'm going to impute a broadband policy to this country uh, because the best I can detect, we don't have one. Uh, and we're going to talk about uh, what I consider to be uh, some of the problems with uh, that, that policy. Then I'm going to talk about telecom policy. And there we have fairly clear policy statements, including the, the 96 Telecom Act and uh, lots of position papers from uh, the various state public utilities commissions and so on. Um, but I'm going to be somewhat critical of those. And then I'm going to talk about wired video. And this is where I'm worried about the timing. I may wave my hands a lot at wired video and tell you to go look at the slides later. Uh, and so on. And then finally, um, I'm going to wrap it all up with uh, the, the, the smallest of an overall conclusion that you uh, can imagine. And it may not uh, be uh, too surprising when we get there. So uh, the broadband policy, uh, if I had a lot more time, I'd go and sort of tell you the, the accidental history of how I got involved in this. But essentially dates from several studies back in the, uh, from 2000 on uh, that I did. And I, I've, I've put some of the slides together and things like that. And I've updated some of the, the data for today, but not all of it. So some of it's, uh, you know, 2000 was a long time ago in this business. Uh, so some of it's quite old. And, but in talking about this, I want to really make sure that it's clear to those of you who are economists uh, that I'm not talking about market failure in the traditional economic sense. Um, first of all, that there are formal definitions of market failure that economists use. Um, my favorite is uh, from uh, Francis Batour uh, from 50 years ago. Uh, that uh, the failure of a more or less idealized system of price market institutions to sustain desirable activities. I mean, the weasel word in that is desirable. And I don't want to really get into uh, talking about uh, economic efficiency in great detail and what it is that we actually desire to have the, this market do. Um, what I want to do is talk about sort of uh, coverage and pricing and availability and some things like that. So rather than get in, and if you want, I can give you a good long lecture on market failure in Broadway, but I'm going to give you a market policy failure lecture where I want to focus on the policy and the policy issues. So, but I'm going to use the traditional economic framework, which says that industry structure influences the conduct of the firms mainly through pricing, and that influences broadband penetration. But what makes this interesting, why this isn't an energy talk, is it also influences content and access. And that's where you have to keep in the back of your mind as we go through all of this, that uh, there are some really interesting, well, as we Americans would say, First Amendment uh, related issues, but issues related to who has access to what information, who produces what information, um, and all sorts of interesting things in, in that sort. Um, so there are a whole bunch of technology policy issues too, 
And one of the things that, that I find interesting in all this is we have to understand the underlying economics. We have to understand the technologies. We have to understand how the business models emerge here. And then we can get some insight onto the appropriate role of government and regulators. OK. So I mean, at, at, at several points in writing this slide, I was tempted to say, who knows uh, what the policy is. but. Um, there's no least access or compulsory line sharing uh, that the, the people who build and operate the physical plant that gets broadband to households and businesses have control over what gets carried to some extent. There's no un longer any, UNI is the, the acronym for unbundled network elements. No longer any selling off of parts of the services, the switching, the carriage, the backhaul, whatever, on a compulsory basis at posted prices uh, that uh, we tried uh, at the earlier years in this decade. And uh, there's, as a result, uh, very few benefits from resale and uh, other sorts of uh, models. What we're relying on, if you hope for competition to, to provide, uh, reasonable prices and a reasonable amount of access uh, to the broadband network is intermodal competition. And that's the, the phrase you'll hear out of the FCC. That uh, there's the cable-based people and uh, the DSL, predominantly based telephone people, and that uh, uh, you know X percent of census districts or of zip codes have at least one household that has one service from at least from two or more of those is their definition of competition. One household per zip code. Uh, uh, there are lots of complaints about that and uh, they're working on new data and so on. Um, the results I allege and I think I can document um, as a result of this are that the prices are higher than necessary even after you adjust for speed and income levels and so on. The penetration is less than um, what one would expect uh, or hope for for a uh, developed country in, uh, with the, the level of technology we have and also contributes to the discussions of the digital divide. And one of the things that got me involved in this was that I was very upset with some of the early discussions about digital divide and access by neighborhood and so on, which seem to ignore the industry structure questions, which were uh, driving some of this. So uh, when I first started to do this, um, the, if you looked at a ranking of, uh, this is just DSL because that's where I had the data in those days, uh, DSL penetration uh, in 2001 to 2002, in one year the U.S. dropped from fifth to tenth uh, internationally. Um, and uh, currently, at least with the ITU data from 2005, we're 16th or somewhere below that. And uh, this is a combined DSL and cable uh, and other. And uh, the, this data set seems to be actually reasonably good uh, from the ITU. Yes, yeah. um, and uh, the Taiwan is uh, Chinese Taipei only. Um, I did not rewrite the names of any economic regions or countries uh, on, uh, when I snipped any of these tables, although I've given this talk internationally and uh, some of the venues I was required to do so, I just refused. Uh, okay. Using the 2002 data, um, I made probably one of the worst regressions ever done. Uh, I plotted six numbers uh, with uh, effective monthly cost and uh, uh, one carrier per country and fit a curve to it and called it a demand curve. Um, but the, the bottom line lesson here is that it is a typical downward sloping demand curve if you have any faith in it at all, and I don't want to allege that you should have much, uh, that uh, there is a correlation between uh, lower prices and higher penetration. 
And I started collecting uh, quotes. I won't even go through them. Uh, and I gave a version of this talk back in 2005 just on the broadband side um, and from a variety of people uh, about the, the policy failure, uh, including uh, the chairman of the FCC. Okay, so what are the problems here? That the speed adjusted price for broadband coverage uh, and access in the United States is still high despite economies of scale and despite it being a decreasing cost industry, which is a technical term in economics, meaning that as your industry grows, your suppliers have economies of scale and new generations of technology and can lower the, the, the prices they charge you for your inputs. And if you look at subscriber line interface cards or modems or uh, cable modem termination service uh, hardware or whatever, uh, the hardware prices, all those things have been dropping rather remarkably. And um, nonetheless, uh, the price stays high and um, probably because of the high concentration, which if anything has been increasing. So here are some uh, broadband costs uh, for household uh, use from back in 2003 adjusted for speed and income level to, to make that point. And here is uh, similar data from 2007. This graph, I have to warn you, is from the Wall Street Journal is about the worst graph I've ever seen because uh, the, the axes aren't lined up. Uh, so just be real careful. Uh, they, they just moved everything over to the left. Uh, they should have taken uh, Professor Hurst's visualization course uh, or something, but nonetheless, you can get some idea. And th this is continuing. Um, AT&T in the Midwest has just raised its price for DSL uh, back in uh, February. And uh, uh, here's a long quote uh, from uh, Dave Bernstein about what some of their costs are and, and uh, what's uh, been happening there. Um, and then there have been uh, real interesting, that was focused mostly on the DSL side, although not all that data because the, the blue and yellow chart had both uh, DSL and the cable modem service. But uh, if you look at the cable modem industry, that's really interesting because there's been just a massive shift in the business model as at home was driven out of business by its uh, uh, partners uh, and the cable companies took over direct control of providing uh, broadband access uh, throughout the, the U.S. Uh, with tiered services and so on. Um, if you believe that mobile is going to be the, the solution, I don't. Uh, and uh, wireless lands, others have problems too. Um, the bottom line here is, should we take what's called the essential facilities doctrine that's used in other parts of transportation and communications in the United States, dating back to antitrust laws to the, the beginning of the 20th century, and apply that to these networks? Should um, DSL or cable modem users be able to choose their ISP? And uh, should more than one uh, carrier be able to use uh, the plant that goes into the home? Or should the owner of the plant control that access? Um, maybe the new 700 megahertz spectrum will uh, change some of the nature of this competition. Um, but if you look at who the winners in that bat bidding battle are, I have my doubts there too. AT&T and Verizon were the two big winners. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I should restate that. Verizon and AT&T were the two big winners, uh, putting the bigger one first is the chunks of spectrum they got. Um, so summary on all this is that I think I, I can show reasonably well that uh, that this industry structure, set of decisions, whether you call them a policy or not, have influenced the terms of access. That may even affect content. I have a whole set of lectures about that, which I'm not going to cover today, as to um, illustrate the fact that, that, that content issues 
the walled garden approach on uh, uh, mobile cellular, uh, mobile uh, broadband and so on, uh, being an example there, and so on, uh, being a risk. Okay, so now let's turn to telecom policy, uh, which is another policy failure. And here, based on two separate sets of studies, one based on that unbundled network element policy that existed for a few years, uh, 2002 through 2004, and has gone away. But it's when the old AT&T and MCI uh, started to compete for residential telephone service in several states uh, to provide uh, a voice, uh, local voice service, as well as uh, their traditional long distance business. And then the more recent proceedings on local deregulation uh, here in California, and then in particular some work that was done in Canada, uh, and so on. Um, so I'm going to focus on local residential voice service, and I want to warn you that I, even I have doubts as to whether that's a market uh, anymore. Um, but most people are still buying uh, residential switched voice telephone service as a separate thing, not bundled with anything else yet. But whether that continues is really interesting. And what's happening is that there are new facilities-based ways of getting that as cable TV companies and the VOIP providers provide uh, challenges to the traditional monopoly of the local telephone company. Um, and, but we aren't there yet, and nobody's arguing this market's fully competitive, but the transition is particularly interesting. And I'm going to highlight one of the problems that the transition has uh, shown us. So in doing this, you have to, as economists, look at the analytical framework. And the classic work here is uh, uh, Fred Kahn's uh, Economics of Regulation from the 1970s book. But sort of people started to rethink that with Michael Porter's uh, work in the 1980s and so on, looking at the strategic responses of the firm to the regulation rather than modeling the regulation. Uh, here's another indicative timeline, and I'll, while I take a sip, you can look at it. Um, and let's see where we are. Um, now, I'm not an engineer, but as an economist who makes use of engineering and technical work, here's my view of the key technological features of the networks. The telephone networks are interconnected star networks. The telephone networks all use SS7 as a common signaling uh, system throughout the world. Um, cable systems, on the other hand, are a trunk system with uh, drops traditionally, although in the UK uh, they're a star network. Um, and the cable systems traditionally were not interconnected. Uh, and that's something important to remember. They would have a satellite head end, like you can see in El Cerrito or elsewhere, where they would grab programming off of one or another satellite, as well as some over-the-air programming, and then they would uh, send that out on uh, a, a wired system. Cable networks divided into channels. Uh, traditionally, they were the six megahertz channels that paralleled uh, broadcast TV uh, frequencies. <laughs> The other thing to remember is that local access is valuable because of the services it provides customers. You can make a phone call. And it enables the delivery of additional services. What in the telephone business is called vertical features. Voicemail, caller ID, call waiting, call forwarding. Uh, whatever. OK. So, the question is, um, in this pressure for local deregulation, for forbearance in the, the Canadian speak, um, is there effective competition? Um, there looked like there was a movement toward that in 2002 through 2004 with the entry of uh, additional competitors through the unbundled network elements. Uh, but uh, that business model was essentially uh, made non-profitable by the some court decisions, although EU policies now follow that unbundled network element uh, type of model. 
Um, we get time. If you want to know how effective the competition was back in the unbundled network element days, I've got posted the report so you can look at the slides. But the bottom line is that uh, AT&T and MCI got 15 to 20 percent of the market. Prices came down for a, a wide set of users, and there were uh, millions and millions of dollars of savings uh, to residential users as a result of that competition. So the, the question is, now that we are seeing that cable companies and VOIP providers entering uh, voice telephone network, is there enough competition to deregulate prices? And what are the likely effects? Who are the beneficiaries? What are the problems? What are the strategic implications? Um, and here I want to make it really clear to you that there's two competing schools of thought. One says, you have more competitors, you got competition. The other says, counting the number of competitors isn't enough. What you have to ask is, do the new entrants or the set of entrants have sufficient market power to provide pressure on prices and on the delivery of services to the incumbent? And will that be sustainable over time? Okay, so what are the content questions that we're talking about? One is, um, are the carriers, the, the, the competitor and the incumbents, likely to collude? As a result, you may not get all the effects of competition. And the other is, is there going to be cream skimming? And I'm going to talk a lot about that because that may be a new term to some of you. Meaning that they will only go after certain market segments and a whole bunch of other people will not benefit from this competition. I gave this talk in Germany and I had to look up what some of the words were. Any of you German? The, the word for cream, the phrase for cream skimming in Germany is now cream skimming. Uh, okay, so what I want to talk about is I went back and looked at the uni-based studies that I had done uh, where the effect was uh, this uh, uh, drop in prices and savings of millions of dollars, but found out that it was concentrated under uh, uh, to a sel select group of households. It wasn't spread evenly across the the entire uh, set of consumers. And I wanted to come up with an explanation of what was going on. And uh, I gave some examples of some of the prices and who was looking at what. Um, and essentially what happened is that the new entrants target high value consumers. Uh, they go after those who are willing to use a lot of service, making calls, use a lot of vertical services that we talked about, and who, as a result, are more often than not higher income households and so on. And those are the ones that they design their product offerings uh, for. There are some sustainability issues from that in that the incumbent loses revenue and more than proportionally loses profits. And it puts pressure on the price of the basic service. So um, really should have drawn this in three dimensions, but I can't do that in PowerPoint. Uh, that the third dimension should be usage of the vertical services uh, coming, picture coming out from the, the, the axes. Um, so all I did is I plotted uh, usage of long distance uh, and local toll and other things on the horizontal axis, revenue on the vertical axis, and the traditional pricing was there's a flat fee, A1, and a usage fee, B1, that gives you a revenue line that's that one, and depending on the level of usage. What the entrance traditionally would do is come in with a bundled price, A2, above A1, with unlimited or close to unlimited usage bundled in, and with a lot of features. What this means is that there is a loss if the 
users who used less than you had didn't have basic service at A1 still available, they'd all have to pay A2, and this shaded area in, in pale yellow is um, the w total amount of welfare loss that would exist. And that's known as an efficiency loss in, in economics. What is the response that you'd expect then from the incumbents? Well, they want to keep some of those high-end users, so what they can do is try and come up with some kind of compromise. And I purposely drew this so you can't tell where the, the, the new crossover point is because it's unclear. It depends on the ratio of A1 prime and B1 prime and how that compares to the old A1 and B1 and to the old A2 as to exactly where things happen. But to the extent that the old usage price actually reflected some kind of economic efficiency that usage was priced at its cost, we're moving away from that. So there's an efficiency loss. Now, nobody cares about efficiency loss but economists. Uh, but the sustainability of the incumbents matters because they're the ones providing the basic service to the low end users at the old A1 price. And that's going to creep up. So, in fact, what you get is this pressure for the incumbent phone companies to raise their prices for basic service in response to competition, which is really counterintuitive to anything you would have been taught in not only Econ 1, but even in Econ 10 or 101. Um, and yet it's perfectly explainable here, and it's not the fault of the evil local telephone company. It's they want to maintain their revenue. They want to cover their costs. In fact, they'd like to even grow, although that may not be possible given uh, uh, the transition to competition and so on. And so then the question is, what should the regulators do? Well, I want to give you two options, um, both of which have problems. So what the CRTC, the, the Canadian regulator, did is it required the incumbents to continue to offer the basic service at the old price, even as it introduced new packages and bundles and things like that. I should point out, this happened in 2006, and Parliament threw out the regulator as a result. Uh, this story is not over. Um, and then the alternative is uh, California, also in 2006, decision where they said, effective January 1, 2009, that basic price, that old A1, gone, going to be completely deregulated. That's got problems, too. So, in fact, um, they allowed California, uh, the four incumbent phone companies, one of which serves us, is the biggest, and then uh, Verizon covers the LA and area and a few other places. And then there are two other ones that are reasonably big but much smaller than them. Um, we're given freedom to change the, the price of the vertical services, and they've already moved up twice. Okay, let me just, in the three minutes, talk a little bit about wired video delivery services. So one of the things that the phone companies have done in response to this is to look at the third leg of that broadband telecom video uh, set of markets and say, well, if the cable companies are entering broadband and voice, we're going to enter video. And um, now I've been involved in cable TV research, I hate to admit this, going back 30 years uh, with some uh, NSF studies of uh, state regulation. You probably don't. Most people aren't even alive, but uh, those of you who were don't even probably remember that 10 states actually regulated cable TV companies. Uh, and I actually was chair of a cable TV commission. But more recently, I went back and, and did some work on uh, the effects of this. And um, I want to argue 
Pendle, and you don't have to believe this argument, but just keep it in the back of your mind, that wired video delivery service is separable and identifiable from all video delivery services because, first of all, the amount of people who are getting their video over the air is declining, and second of all, the satellite people can't offer the packages with broadband. Uh, at least not yet, and or not in, in ways that I view as a reasonable substitute. So, and here's some, an article from the Financial Times that seems to, to support that line of reasoning. Um, and here's some numbers uh, looking at some uh, Pacific Rim uh, economies uh, with different acronyms for economic areas. Uh, for uh, satellite and cable TV. And you can see that the cable TV is the predominant means of delivery. Uh, okay, so the, the question is, the technology's changing. Um, all the systems are becoming digital. You can use the, the, the telephone plant. And we have some examples where that's been happening and where there is head-to-head -head competition. Prices seem to be dropping and the number of channels offered seem to be increasing. So the price per channel actually drops faster. Um, now whether that'll continue to happen, we don't know. We've got a really interesting case study in that California has um, allowed uh, the, the major incumbent telephone companies to enter wired video delivery. And so I did some estimates of what the, the savings are likely to be. Um, what's going to happen to franchise fees, which was an issue, and so on. Uh, and I claim that using some business data, some data we had on viewing habits and take up of services, and so on, we could actually estimate uh, the gains to the population. I won't go through the numbers, but you can look at all that. Uh, the bill passed uh, both houses, of uh, the California legislature, and was signed by the governor uh, a year and a half ago. And any of you live in an area where uh, AT&T is offering uh, video services to your home? Well, there are some. Uh, and it doesn't have to be fought on a community by community uh, franchise basis anymore. Okay, what's the overall conclusion to all of this? Um, one is that to some extent conversion may be here. Uh, but more importantly, I think that the way well, I want to argue and I, I don't want to oversell the role of economists, but uh, there's a role for technology-informed economic policy inputs into some of these decisions as we move forward. But we're a long way from either having competitive solutions or having the policies all worked out. Thank you, and I'll be happy to take any questions. So the uh, United States doesn't seem to be uh, very competitive in its telecom uh, uh, policies. However, are there any countries that you can point to that have greater uh, competition yeah. and policies that encourage uh, in, um, other than incumbent exchange carriers? Yeah, okay. So on the two obvious examples, let's see if I can pull up the data real quick, maybe not are uh, South Korea and Japan. Um, Japan has unbundled the networks. Uh, the broadband providers uh, do a, a pretty good job of providing service at uh, uh, reasonable prices. I think that's the slide, yeah. And Japan is sort of in the middle here. And I guess you could argue that the economy is somewhat similar to ours, although it's much more urbanized. And that's one of the problems in, in looking at the data. South Korea is also much more urbanized and so on. Um, there have been new entrants in certain parts of the market, but there's been real government push. I mean, they've taken the indus infant industry argument uh, almost to, to, to the extreme in supported uh, rollout of services and so on. But they're at the top of, uh, on this chart. Okay, so it's true for broadband, but what are the, about other services? 
Um, no, and, and voice is, is, is priced much more reasonably also, and video. Um, but I don't know the pricing of video, actually, to tell you the truth, for other countries. So are these, are these companies in Japan and Korea, are they essentially the carriers or just? No, I mean, in, they, in Japan, it's, it's Yahoo. Uh, and uh, some of the others that are uh, uh, actual carriers. Yahoo Japan. Yep. I couldn't help uh, no notice this. Uh, there's a discrepancy for the broadband. Uh, the, the price difference in the specific items between the States and the Korean. Uh, one of the slides you show, like, there's a difference in terms of the subscription sheet fee per, per month and the money per, what, a kilobytes? So I'm just wondering what's your justification, because you also mentioned there's a content issue. That's yeah. something. OK, so one of the questions is um, who's paying for the upgrades to the network? Uh, and in the, the Korea situation, as I understand it, and I've been, the conventional wisdom is the government has um, underwritten large amounts of the infrastructure improvement. Um, when I have tried to track that down, I've been told that that is not, in fact, the case, that the government has made it clear that it wants the, the companies to do that and that it is not taxpayer dollars that is paying for the network upgrades. It's the companies spending the money. But whether you believe that um, it's government spending or government leadership, in any case, it's government involvement in the South Korea case that has been really active in getting uh, the, the bandwidth up. And the same in Japan now, um, though, because it was content providers and others who were using the networks and willing to pay through the unbundling, there have been massive increases in the uh, capacity of the, the networks uh, there also. We've had some other cases where, uh, don't get me wrong, where we're not, we are not the, the, the only policy failure in the world. Um, uh, Germany uh, moved along a path of encouraging digital networks completely, which worked pretty well in the East, but then led to uh, the problems in the already built out areas in the West lagging behind, and then a delay in rolling out of DSL and equivalent sorts of things. So you can have government involvement and get it wrong, too. Uh, I want to make sure that that's clear. So you're saying that basically it doesn't really reflect uh, whether there's a, a void in the content of the what uh, consumer wants to have and what's really out there? Could this yeah. reflect the... No, the I'm saying that's the area we don't know, and that's where we need to do more research. In, in this country, it is against our political grain to get involved in questions about content. Yet, if you look at the, the popularity of uh, videos on the, the web or of other things, it's clearly there's a demand for new forms of content, some of which are fairly bandwidth intensive. And the question is then how you make reasonable policy in those situations. I don't have all the answers. Um, my question relates to the telecom deregulation. Um, with the deregulation of uh, the large um, of the uh, of the Bell company to Baby Bells, uh, you would have expected that it would have resulted in um, it would have resulted in more companies with the divergent or or, or with uh, many different kinds of solutions, but. I'm not sure how. I'm not. I'm not. I've not done any kind of study. I'm not referring to any kind of study. But it seems to me that, f for example, with the AT&T and SBC merger, that there, were, there is there was some kind of re seems to be some kind of reversal to that process. I'm not sure what it is. And then, in addition to that, just I'm, for example, here in, here in California, it seems to me that all this that um, AT&T is probably the only. Is a major delivery uh, uh, telecom delivery company in this area, and that would probably lead it to 
probably uh, dominate in lots of other services if, it, if some kind of co convergence happens. So what I'm trying to figure out here is how, how is it that the whole process of deregulation, which is supposed to increase competition, has result, has seems to be turning around in a different way. Okay. Um, there are a lot of questions all rolled into one there, and I'm going to try and separate them out. So the first is a question of nationally, how many firms should there be? If they have separate geographic monopolies, does it even matter whether they're all one or there's four or there's seven or uh, whatever uh, it is? And that was really unclear in the, the, the breakup of AT&T, how that was going to play out. Um, and depending on how you want to count, there's three or four that, that have survived, but they won't go into each other's markets and so on. And they do use, at least in the video delivery, very different technologies uh, with Fios, a fiber-based system for Verizon, and uh, the, the AT&T SBC uh, uh, copper-based uh, system, and so on. But for any one household, you're in one area or the other. And, um, but that's, that's an area we don't have a good model for as economists or nationally or whatever. Now, on the other hand, the Canadians do, and they know that. And the, the Canadians know the two uh, is the, the, the right number. They have fewer people, and they have just this history of duopoly and railroads and duopoly and long-distance carriers and duopoly. And, whatever. and they know it doesn't work but it seems to be better than any of the other options. Uh, but here, whether it's airlines, where the number has just changed rather remarkably in the last week, or uh, whatever, we don't really know how many national uh, carriers is a, the right number with these geographic um, monopolies. So great area for research. Um, and part of it is that the demographics of the markets are different. Uh, Bell South area looked different from uh, SBC's area, but they were very much alike compared to U.S. West territory, which is uh, my, my bias. Nobody lives in U.S. West territory. Uh, you know, uh, the number of households per square mile or whatever is very low compared to uh, the major uh, uh, other carriers and, and so on. So that drives some of that too. Um, that was one question. The other is, do there, I think, at times, was a hope that these at least regional carriers would move into each other's markets and provide competition. And in fact, that's what did happen in Japan to some extent. Uh, NTT East and NTT West, to some degree, actually compete. Um, be an interesting study if one could find out whether or not there really was collusion and an agreement to stay out of each other's markets or they just decided that it's just not in our interest to do this. Uh, but there are very few uh, corporations with the resources to enter a whole uh, full-fledged entry into a telecom market as big as a medium-sized state, let alone a multi-state region. And so that just cuts down the number of competitors. Yeah. We have one more question here. Okay. Yeah. So uh, my question is in the last part of your talk, the wired uh, video. The, you mentioned that technology should somehow impact the regulatory framework. And I can't just, having not thought about it too much, but what would be an example of a technological development which would cause a regulatory answer to change? Oh, well, that one's a, a great one, um, which is the cost of infrastructure coming down. I, I'm an economist. You talk about technology, I think about cost. Uh, but th that's the obvious example. Um, if all of a sudden there was only a 10% premium to have uh, optical fiber and copper and something else going into every home as opposed to a 100% uh, premium, boy, I would expect to see a very different competitive framework coming down the line. Um, similar one, though, could be on the vertical side of that. Uh, that it, one of the problems with the unbundled network element, or, or in the cable business called separations uh, approach to things, is the contracting is very complex. Uh, control over programming and access can be complex, and so on. If we could make use of 
uh, modern computers and other things to, to, to uh, enable that to work more smoothly and lower cost than you could have. Um, uh, you know, the, the British take the over-the-air broadcasters and, and divide up the channels by time of day and day of the week. So you get phenomena like London Weekend Television. Well, we could do that. We could have a different uh, content provider on the weekends than on weekdays uh, or whatever. Um, it's just that, that the economics don't seem to favor that uh, type of uh, situation. Sorry, I got distracted. Uh, it was a great talk. I want to thank you very much for coming today. And I uh, will see everybody next week, hopefully. Thanks a lot. Thank you.